Let me take care of your coat, Prudence, I offered, helping her remove the fur cape. Thanks, Mike, she smiled. I'll see you at the bar after you finish this little job. It was then that I noticed Steve Watkins and Barry Reynolds standing between me and the dressing room. I could barely hide my disgust as I tried to get around them to hang Prudence's fur. I hear you named your wife Prudence, Mikey, Steve laughed. That's a name you don't hear very often. In fact, she must be the first Prudence I've ever seen. I don't know what you've heard, Steve, I replied. I don't think you heard me call my wife by her first name, though. You're always playing these word games. And you're damn accurate, Mike. Make it easy, Steve growled. Is your wife's name Prudence or not? Well, yes, that's her name, but you can't expect me to tell you that. You've probably heard it, I argued. I had worked for Dittmar Corporation for 12 years, but a few weeks before, I had been assigned to the Utica branch of the company. In that rather short period of time, I had learned to dislike Steve intensely. He was lazy, unpleasant, vain, and amoral. Barry Reynolds was his friend, and at least it seemed that way, he was Robin under Batman, Steve. Steve and I both thought we were on the waiting list to become branch manager, so there was a natural rivalry. He ridiculed me and my work as much as he could, but because his efforts were extremely incorrect, I never felt the need to respond to them directly. I just kept doing my job as well as I could, I was just doing it much better than Steve, at least in my humble opinion. That factoid only encouraged him to do even more brazen damage to my reputation. Your wife's got great boobs, Mike. At least they look like a solid three, Steve remarked. You can see them well in that dress. What is she, some kind of whore? Steve's attempts to tease me were pathetic, it was obvious he was trying to piss me off. I played this game long enough to know how to win at it, patience and intelligence always take precedence over loud words and rash actions. I'm sure I won't discuss my wife's bust with you, Steve, I replied. She certainly is not a whore, she's a lady and should be treated appropriately. Steve couldn't just leave it at that. I realized he must have had a drink by now, he was like an animal on the prowl, wanting to take a bite out of me any way he could. If you're so sure your wife's a lady, you ought to be willing to make a little bet, Steve reasoned, winking at his buddy Barry. I don't make bets, Steve. You are, it's too early to kiss ass. Mike, Steve grinned. Old man Mumford won't be here for at least a couple of hours. He called Tom and told him he'd be late for the party and hoped everyone would be here when he got here. This news did not make me happy. I felt obligated to get to the Christmas party early to make a good impression on Dirk Mumford, who had recently been named CEO of Dittmar Corporation. I had met him several times over the years and knew that he insisted that employees live up to his expectations. It was either that or get out. Now I would have to spend a few extra hours making sure he knew I was attending a company event. This meant that Steve would have more opportunities to piss me off. Steve could see that this news annoyed me even more than his tasteless babbling. It seemed to cheer him up and make him bet. You're being vomitously right, Mike, and you think it's going to get you the manager's job. And you think your trophy wife is so loyal and faithful, it makes me sick, he practically spit on me. I bet I can fondle your wife's breasts before midnight. I wouldn't be surprised if I went even further, but I'll bet you 50 bucks I could get at least that far. Do you really think I had ever engaged in such a stupid bet, Steve? I asked incredulously. You don't know anything about my wife. Don't involve her in this pointless argument. This conversation is over, you dumbass woodpecker, Steve growled. You keep pretending you're better than me. The truth is, you don't trust that whore unless she's right in front of you. You're afraid I'll win the bet. That's why you pretend to be outraged. You're a real asshole, damn it. Now I was furious. How could a man allow another man to talk about his wife like that while keeping his pride intact? I quickly formulated a plan. It was time to throw Steve out of the race for the position. Fifty bucks is nothing to talk about, I grinned. I'll bet five hundred and leave the money with Barry. Saying this, I opened my wallet, took out five hundred dollar bills, and held them out to Barry. To Steve's credit, he barely blinked as he followed my example. This is going to be real fun, he gloated. 
We need a couple of simple rules, you can't warn that bitch about our bet. In fact, you can't even talk to her if Barry and I aren't around. Well, that's fair, I agreed. Barry's got a thousand bucks now. If you can't get my wife's breasts by midnight, he'll give me all the money. If you pull it off, it's yours. That's it. That's fine with me. If I can get your wife's breast before midnight, Barry gives me the money. Otherwise, you get it, Steve agreed. Barry must stick around to witness your punishment for being overconfident. It's a deal. I'll let him be the judge to gauge how successful you are with my wife to win the bet, I admitted. That's it. We had a bet, asshole, Steve grinned. Just don't blame me if your wife loses interest in you after I play with her bust tonight. She'll probably want me to fuck her too, Steve. If you manage to fondle my wife's breasts before midnight, you can fuck her any way you want, as far as I'm concerned, I admitted. If you're that good, I can't stop you anyway. Now you're talking business, Mike. I like that attitude. I'll give her the best sex of her life just to ruin your life. After tonight, she'll never be happy with you again, Steve sobbed. With those words, Stephen Barry turned and walked toward the bar where Prudence should have been by now. I, on the other hand, still had to find a coat rack, so it was a few minutes before I could leave the dressing room. When I got back to the party, I saw Steve already dancing with Prudence. I went to the bar and ordered myself a beer, then I wandered around the room for a while. I needed to kill time, so I went from table to table and had a few words with everyone there. I was determined to stay away from Prudence for the rest of the evening. I hoped she wouldn't notice that I was avoiding her. I didn't want to do anything that would ruin my chances of getting an easy $500 and also rid me of Steve forever. It was Christmas, and extra money would always come in handy. It occurred to me that I could do commercials. There's a MasterCard for purchases, the position of manager is invaluable. I chatted for a while with Tom Barrager, the current branch manager. He indicated that he plans to retire by next fall. His dream was to spend the winter playing golf rather than shoveling snow. I guess you heard Dirk Mumford call to say he was going to be late, Tom asked. His flight was delayed, and he's very angry. I'd advise everyone to stay away from him when he arrives. You're right, Tom, I agreed. He spent 10 years in the Marines, and he won't take crap from anyone, even on a good day like this. You met him, Mike. You seem to know something about him, Tom remarked. He was my boss at Harrisburg for three years. We're not friends or anything, but we got along, I explained. I wonder if Steve knows about that, Tom grinned. He's determined to beat you from my job when I retire. As you know, I can't find a replacement myself, and I wouldn't want to. Steve would lick my ass so deep I'd have to go to the proctologist. He'd better suck up to Mumford when he gets here. Mumford will blow Steve's ass off the moment he sees it, Tom, I said. I think you're substituting logic for hopes and dreams, Tom admitted. Steve may be annoying, but his record is clean, and he's made the right moves. He's managed to make some powerful friends in high places. As much as I hate to admit it, he has as good a chance of getting my job as you do, maybe even better. You like a good bet, don't you, Tom? I'll bet you $500 Mumford fires him tonight. You can buy yourself a new set of clubs like Tiger Woods, I encouraged him. Did you talk to Mumford? Tom asked. Do you have any confidential information? Only that Mumford's the shooter. He'll shoot Steve in the ass by the end of the night if he gets here, I said confidently. I think I'll take that bet, Mike, Tom said, holding out his hand. Steve is an ass kisser and a shithead. He won't give you a chance to take my position, I couldn't hold back a smirk as I shook Tom's hand. How many priceless MasterCard moments can one guy have? I looked in the crowd for Steve, so I'm coming out of the bar with a couple of glasses in his hands. He was all smiles as he held one out to Prudence. He must have assumed I was watching him, he turned his head in my direction and winked openly. I knew the angles, so I rubbed my eye with my middle finger. He caught on to what I meant, and his shoulders shook with silent laughter. He was really enjoying himself. The thought of him messing up my marriage seemed to make his night. He monopolized Prudence for the entire evening, they danced, they sipped drinks, they laughed. 
Steve worked her as hard as he could. I had to begrudgingly give him credit, he knew what he was doing and worked hard at it. If he had worked that hard at his job, I wouldn't have had a chance at the manager's position. Steve was careful not to let Prudence talk much with the other guests. I assume he didn't want anyone to remind Prudence that she was a married woman. He also didn't want to risk losing her undivided attention. It was like watching a master at work, he played it like a violin. By 10 o'clock, my doubts began to creep in. Prudence and Steve danced every slow dance. It was obvious that she was already drunk and had listened to the nonsense that Steve had regaled her with. Mumford was nowhere to be seen, and many of the partygoers began to whimper softly, after all, it's so hard to kiss ass that can't be found. I lost sight of Prudence around 10.30, and now I was really starting to worry. This night could cost me dearly. I'd have to give Tom a check to cover his bet. I pictured myself explaining to Prudence that I had lost a $500 bet at the company Christmas party. She would never know about the $500 in cash if I lost it. There are some things wives don't realize, and losing a bet is one of them. You can win a dozen bets in a row but lose one important one like that, and then you're the dumbest woodpecker in the world. As I pondered the fickleness of women, I heard the crowd buzzing deafeningly. Looking around, I saw Dirk Mumford entering the hall, smiling and shaking hands as he went. Just then, Barry came up to me and started tugging on my sleeve. Barry was grinning from ear to ear, didn't even pay attention to Mumford's arrival, he looked like a cat that had just caught a canary. Mike, cross from the men's room. Steve has something he wants to show you, Barry insisted, turned, and practically ran toward the room he had just mentioned. He cautiously opened the door and slipped inside, closing it carefully behind him. Hello, Mike, muttered Mumford, coming toward me and extending his hand. Hi, Dirk, I replied, much less loudly, shaking his hand. Nice to see you made it to this party after all. It wasn't easy, Mike. I gave the cabbie 50 bucks to run a few stoplights to get here faster, he laughed. Where's Prudence? She's here, isn't she? Yes, she is, Dirk. The last time I saw her, she went into that room over there, across from the men's room, I answered, pointing to the door that Barry had just closed. Mumford grimaced and headed toward the room. It was well past midnight when I dialed my wife on my cell phone. She answered on the third ring. You're just a deadbeat, Mike, she began to argue. Prudence, listen to me, I begged her. There is news that will make you forgive me. Just listen, please. Well, all right, Mike replied. Prudence, it has to be something good, or you'll be sleeping in a dog box at Christmas. No it. I believe you, I replied. That asshole Steve Watkins bet me he could shake your boobs tonight. The bet was $500. One of the terms of the bet was that I wouldn't talk to you until midnight. That's why I'm calling you now. Is that so? What made him so sure he could handle it, Mike? Prudence demanded an answer. It's a long story. Somehow, he got it into his head that my wife's name was Prudence, that you had a great bust, and were a bit of a slut. He put it all together in his head and decided to bet $50 that he could strip your breasts of their more than modest covering. I raised the bet to $500 and took it. Just three conditions, I don't talk to you until midnight, his buddy has the money, and that he'll judge which one of us wins, I added. Do I have great breasts? I like that part. I just can't forgive you for not calling me at 10 like you promised, I'm afraid. I see where you're going with this, Mike. Did that asshole ask to see my ID or something, she asked. Yeah, no, he never actually asked for a photo or anything, if that's what you mean, I replied. You know exactly what I mean, Mike. I'm almost afraid to ask. Was Dirk there tonight? Yes, he was, although his flight was delayed and he didn't show up until almost 11, Mike. Was she wearing one of those little dresses that show most of her fake breasts and had too much to drink? Prudence asked. So, did you win that damned bet? Yes, to all of those questions. That's exactly one of the reasons I called you, besides the fact that I missed you so much. I'm gonna hand the phone over to Barry Reynolds. He's already a former Ditmar employee who has that money we bet. Tell him your name and how long we've been married, 
so I can pick them up. I don't know if Steve's in jail or the hospital, either way, he lost the bet. I'm getting on a flight back to Pittsburgh Friday night. Pick me up at the airport, and we'll celebrate, honey. Prudence may seem like an unusual name to some, but I know at least two. There's you, of course, and then there's Prudence Mumford. Steve and Barry met Prudence Mumford tonight. Somehow, I don't think they'll get a chance to meet you now, I admitted.